So welcome everyone. I'm very excited for today's webinar. Um, this webinar originated from a conversation I had with uh, Juan Pablo Puy that some people may know or not. Um, so we are planning to actually organize a, a summer school this summer. And he challenged me to explain in kind of an overview lecture uh, the contents of what I would like to explore in that summer school. And, um, and I took up the challenge and this is how this uh, originated. And as a result, in this lecture, maybe you'll find that I'll go a little bit fast in some parts of the lecture. So if, if that means you cannot follow, I apologize. But um, what I would like to ask you is to note down any questions you may have so that we can discuss them afterwards. I think that's the, the idea. So I hope to not speak for too long and then afterwards we can have a nice discussion. So let me first try to introduce myself. Um, in case anyone doesn't know me, I think, well, some of you I haven't really met yet. My name is uh, Daniel Bernardus van Schalkwijk, or Dan mm -hmm. for short. And I use my first names, Daniel Bernardus, as an author name, International, because my last name van Schalkwijk is such a hassle for, <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, I was trained as a theoretical biologist. Um, that's a combination of mathematics, biology, and philosophy. And I first focused in my academic career on biology and mathematics. I made a computational model of cholesterol in our body. Um, and later on, I went on to teach at the Liberal Arts College here in Amsterdam, and I started to focus more on philosophy. Um, I'm now working on a, a PhD in philosophy, and in that PhD, I will, study, I will work on the philosophy of Leonardo Polo and especially explore connections with health. Now, what is also relevant for my intellectual journey is my uh, the syndrome of Gilles de la Tourette, which with which I was diagnosed um, early, when I was in my early 20s. Um, it meant I made some kind of unexpected and unwanted movements and sounds, and it also made me absent-minded and quickly tired. And people say that Gilles de la Tourette is like a neurological disorder. So it's something in our body that goes wrong. Uh, it has to do with a uh, dysfunction in dopamine, I've read somewhere. And people say there's also some genetic predisposition for it. But there's a question here, which is, you know, is Tourette really something only biological or, or is there more to it? So that's a question that, of course, has fascinated me for a long time. And it's also um, at the back of some of the things I'm going to talk to you today about today. Now, we human beings have a tendency to settle for easy explanations. When we discover something, we tend to become very excited and we say, wow, I've discovered something. This is going to explain everything. For example, an economist may study uh, consumption behavior and they might say, well, a human being is just a consumer, you know, or a cultural anthropologist might say, well, a human being is determined by its culture, or a biologist might say, we humans are nothing more than just some complex animals, and we are determined by our genes. Now, of course, all these stances are very problematic because, well, for starters, they are in conflict with each other. Of course, you cannot be and determined by your culture and only determined by your genes. So there's something uh, going on. Now, the Spanish philosopher Leonardo Polo, uh, I like to call him uh, a killer of reductionisms because his philosophical method is that of going beyond mental limitation. And it invites us to become aware of how limiting it is to say something is just this or is nothing more than this, right? Instead, he proposes that our intelligence is operatively infinite. And there's always more to know. We can always go on knowing things. While at the same time also maintaining that every separate act of our intellect, so everything, every one thing we understand, um, that is always limited because we cannot just capture everything at once. So we, we always have to continue knowing and go beyond what we already know. So he also describes in a lot of detail how we can be, become aware of such limitations through a type of knowledge that he calls habitual knowledge. Um, and well, I won't describe that in a lot of detail, but it's very interesting. Uh, so he says, we don't only know through concepts. We, there are also, also some 
knowledge that we are just, well, we're aware of that. So I like to actually translate and clarify that as awareness knowledge, because it's not an a knowledge that is in, in, in ideas and in concepts, but it's a knowledge that is more in awareness of certain very fundamental things, or even awareness of our thinking process itself. So be, becoming aware of a process of knowledge helps us to go beyond its limitations and also not to settle for easy reductionisms. And so this is why Leonardo Polo, I think, is a killer of reductionisms. So let's look at one reductionism specifically, which is quite important to this story, and that is that of genetic determinism. And um, I think it's a reductionism that's interesting for me as a biologist, and also as someone dealing with Gilles de la Tourette, uh, because some people might say, well, Tourette is just something in your genes or so. Um, so what is it, this genetic determinism? Well, it is the idea that behavior of biological organisms is determined by their genes and by the environment. So the idea is if we understand these two things and their interplay, then we have understood organisms, including also human beings. Now this stance, even though it might sound a bit extreme, is quite common in popular writings about biology. Um, but interestingly, it's currently being challenged by biological research itself, uh, especially through a deeper understanding of how genes actually work. We're starting to discover a lot more about that, and there's a lot more to know. So biologists like uh, Emeritus Professor um, Dennis Noble from Oxford, they're calling for a rethinking of biological causation and even of the theory of evolution in the light of these new findings about how genes work. Um, because the original theory of evolution was very reductionist in this sense. So I think that Leonardo Polo has actually led quite a bit of groundwork for exactly this project. So in some of his most more popular writings, he Polo has explained how the early scientific method has led to a reductionist view of causation. He said that early scientists used linear mathematics, so like mathematics of straight lines, to describe nature, which is an approach that led to many advances. But because of the structure of linear equations and calculations, they come to the conclusion that, that formal and final causality, two of the Aristotelian causes, were like no longer necessary because uh, where you know if you have a system and it's described by a linear equation then where the system goes and the shape it takes so like the the final finality and the form you can calculate that from the starting points you, you could say well those are determined already so if we only have the starting points the rest is just determined we can calculate that now, Polo shows that indeed, if you think through systems of linear equations, this is true. So the starting points and the starting direction determine the system completely. That, that is correct. But he also goes on to say, in more recent scientific developments have found that linear equations, they remain important, they remain powerful, and they also remain easy to handle. But there are many instances in which they do not suffice. They're just not sufficient. Any system in which feedback loops are introduced, for instance, cannot be described using a linear set of equations. So for example, feedback systems are very important in engineering. So here you see a picture of a thermostat um, to keep a room temperature constant. There's a feedback loop there, right? The, the system does something based on the, the ter temperature in the room and the temperature in the room uh, then changes as a result of the system. And that again, feeds back into the thermostat. So there's a a feedback loop. Um, but these feedback systems are also very essential for living systems. For example, how do you regulate the heartbeat or the sugar levels in your blood? Or you keep track of your daily rhythm. Uh, if you've ever uh, ch had a jet lag, for example, then you see that uh, after a while that, you know, that system needs to reset itself. So uh, there's a feedback from the daily rit the rhythm of the world around you to your own biological rhythm. So for these type of feedback systems, to describe them in a scientific way, you really need nonlinear equations. So linear equations are not enough. You need nonlinear equations. And these type of equations do not support the conclusion that formal and final causality are superfluous 
and that the system is determined because it can all be calculated. No, indeed, they become these, these formal and final causality kind of become properties of the system as a whole. So it's in the system itself uh, that this takes place. Now, in the field of genetics, feedback loops have become much more evident over the last decades, especially with the discovery of epigenetics, a mechanism through which the cell can turn certain genes on or off as needed. So if you have a lot of fat in the cells, then the cell may tell its genes, oh, make more proteins that help me digest this, the fat, for example, or more or less or whatever. So the, the cell actually regulates the genes. Therefore, the agency in the behavior of organisms is understood to shift away from genes and the environment, which of course retain an important influence, but now lies more squarely with the organism itself. So the genes are more of a database, which the organism will use when needed. And these resources can of course be used to try and overcome difficulties in an environment that the organism faces. The attempt can be more or less, be more or less successful, but the agency lies with the organism as a whole, with, with ourselves, um, also in relation with others, also using what we have uh, been given, but it's no longer, you cannot say that we're just kind of tossed about by the environment or tossed about by our genes. No, there's really something else that are we ourselves. And I think this is a very important starting point to come back to the idea that we have a certain agency that is maybe more important than the science would have us or the reductionist science would have us believe. But this leads us to a next question, which is very important. And that is the question, who are we? Because if genes and the environment do not determine us, the pressing question becomes, then who are we? What, what, what are we then? And that is a question that Leonardo Polo has a lot to say about. So one text that I particularly appreciate uh, as an introduction to thinking about the human being is, Lo radical y la libertad, which I helped to translate to English and wrote an extensive preface, preface to, uh, which were published together as uh, Freedom in Quarantine. Now, in this text, that was because we published it in the, in the pandemic, so it was appropriate at that time. Um, in this text, Polo talks about three types of philosophy, modern, classical, and Christian philosophy, which led to three, he calls them in Spanish, radicales, um, so I translated that as roots, um, three roots of being human. And so these roots are three views of what is most important in our humanity. So let me start by the modern roots. And we have a pilot in our midst, which is Case. And so I put a, here a, a nice airplane. And the airplane has a lot to do with the modern route. So Polo explains that the modern route actually arose out of what he calls a flight from interiority. Um, so there was a, in the time, at the time there was a lot of Protestant theology and that had considered um, that our interiority was irreparably degraded. So what was inside of us was so corrupted by sin that really there was nothing to be done with it. Um, and this actually fed a lot into the very science heavy mindset that we just discussed where you know everything has to be thought through in a scientific way because the natural sciences are of course an important tool for understanding and controlling the world around us so it's very exterior focused now according to this view the things we do and the results we achieve are essential to our identity as human beings and um, yeah, I think the airplane is actually a very nice illustration of that, because of course, in, in a way, it really brings us a lot because now we're able to travel all over the world. Um, but of course, the one place it doesn't bring us is inside ourselves. So that is, um, yeah, it's kind of a good good image, you could say. However, this view, when when we really take it seriously, also put a lot puts a lot of pressure on our results. So. These results do not only matter in themselves. I mean, it's nice, of course, to have a good result if from something we do, but they become even essential for our self-understanding, even our self-appreciation. So if I fail at something, it's not just that I fail at something, but that I am a failure. Or if I do something very well, then I am the successful person. And that becomes like super defining for who I am. And that puts a lot of pressure on our results. And that actually leads to a lot of anxiety as well. 
so in the classical view, um, so I'm going over these roots a little bit fast, but I, I think um, it's, I just want to give the overview. In the classical view, um, which we have seen as being in a way reappreciated by modern science, um, sorry, in the classical view, feedback is much more important, and we have seen that feedback is, has been reappreciated by modern science. So classical philosophers especially thought that a, a particular type of a particular type of feedback. What is that? That of our thoughts, the things that we think on ourselves. So how we think about ourselves, how that influences the way we become. So classical philosophers were fascinated by human thought and they discovered one key aspect of it, especially that our ideas, the things that we have in mind, they seem to be timeless. They seem to be not subject to time. So the idea is that our, our ideas do not just change because time passes. So if I have a certain idea, if I sit for an hour, then so the idea doesn't suddenly change. Our body does change. Our body is constantly changes. We don't have to do anything about it. If time passes, our body changes. That just happens. But our ideas, of course, our ideas can change, but we have to work on it for ideas to change. It doesn't just change because of time passing. Um, and also our ideas seem to capture some things in the world around us that also seem to be timeless. I think the clearest uh, example from that actually comes from science. So for example, nowadays we would say that the speed of light doesn't change as time passes because the speed of life is, a, we say is a constant. So it doesn't matter how long you wait, the speed of life is always going to be the same. So that is an, an example of something timeless in the world around us. So classical philosophy understood that some ideas are timeless and also that some ideas about us as human beings are timeless. Even ideas about what is good for us. So for example, they understood that being prudent, being strong, being temperate, being just, there are things that are always good for a human being. So they are kind of ideals that don't change. They're, they're always true, always good. And furthermore, they also understood that these timeless ideals do not just automatically apply to us. We're not just automatically just they're strong or temperate or prudent, but rather we need to freely make them our own. We make them into our own if we make them into habits or stable dispositions. And if we try to do so, we become, uh, we'll, we will have gained virtues. We become virtuous people. So this is an important idea in, in classical philosophy. Now, finally, the, the Christian root, and here we have a nice icon of the Trinity because the Trinity is very important for the key notion about humanity, which is that of personhood. Uh, the notion of Christian notion of personhood was developed in theology about the Trinity. And what does that mean that we are a person? Well, it means that we're not just something, we're not like a human, but we are someone. We are a person with a name. And as a person, we are unique, but our uniqueness lies especially in our relationality, in our relationship between us and God and between us and other human persons. Um, in God, of course, the, the essential thing is the relationship between the three divine persons. Um, yeah, so there's some unique elements of us, like we all have a unique and personal calling. Uh, a specific calling that is only for us. So uniqueness, relationality um, are some key elements of the Christian notion of, of personhood. Now, when confronted with these three views of being human, how could we respond to that if we think about those? You could say, well, oh, that's interesting. Um, there's probably something to all of them. And uh, let's let's just pick and choose. Let's take the nice things out of all of them. But that's a little bit too easy because there are some incompatibilities, which are especially strong between the modern and the classical view. They really kind of are incompatible in a way. Um, because, yeah, the, the, the modern view really goes away from this interiority and the classical view kind of wants to make things kind of work on our interiority. So that's like a, a, diff a tension there. Now, one could say that the focus on personhood, and actually that's what I, I wrote also, 
in my introduction to freedom in freedom and quarantine that the focus on personhood can actually situate both production the, the modern route and the classical emphasis on ideals and virtues in you, what you could say is a broader context the person is kind of a deeper view that could situate the other two uh, it's also a context that gives them additional meaning and significance and well since writing that i've come to understand that that's actually a, a nice idea but and this is the point that i want to focus on today there is an obstacle in practice because after all modern thinkers didn't really come up with that theory for nothing they were fleeing from an interiority that they perceived to be broken uh, they, they perceived to be so influenced by sin that they couldn't really do that they couldn't really do the interior development they felt incapable of intimately relating to ideals and to their personhood so that kind of shows on further reflection that that integration of these three visions is not just a theoretical exercise it also really hits an existential barrier in us that makes it difficult to make this come true so i want to think to you with you today a little bit more about that barrier that makes it difficult to integrate these different views so now we're gonna think a little bit bit more bit more about our brokenness uh, and la vie that i uh, talked about in the um, in the announcement of this lecture and i would like to start telling a bit more about my story with Tourette, which i think is uh, helps to illustrate so for me dealing with Gilles de la Tourette was kind of a privileged experience to get in touch with my own brokenness because when the symptoms first manifested themselves, it was rather strange to me. Uh, at, si at the same time, when they got worse, um, a housemate that I was living with suggested I see a doctor. I went to see a neurologist and that, and that uh, doctor diagnosed me with Tourette's syndrome. Now she gave me two options. So she said, either you can take antidepressants, uh, but she said, well, that would also change your personality or to do cognitive behavioral therapy. So I thought, okay, let's try the second. I prefer not to take a lot of pills. So the therapy was, was actually quite useful. Um, it helped me to become aware of tension building in my body and to try to actively release that tension. It also taught me that relaxation exercises that can help me to actively relax many parts of my body. And actually both of these symptoms did reduce, uh, sorry, both of these approaches did reduce the symptoms of the Tourette, so they were helpful. However, after several years and starting to teach at Amsterdam University College, I found that for several months at the end of the academic year, I really would be exhausted. So teaching was taking up much more energy than, than normal, even though my teaching load was not particularly heavy. So I thought it was probably related to the tension produced by Tourette. So I looked for ways to address that. And I first looked for further kind of classical or normal psychology, but they said they could only do more of the same. So I looked for other alternatives. And then I came in touch um, with uh, Paco Moya because a befriended priest pointed me towards an article about him, um, a doctor who had developed a methodology known as Palingenesia, which was inspired by Leonardo, Leonardo Polo, he said, and I had also helped people with Tourette, he explained in the article. So clearly, because I was studying Polo and I had Tourette, so he was my guy. So I went to him for treatment. And to be honest, a whole new world opened up for me. So Paco helped me get access to memories from the past that were somehow producing tension in me and addressing these memories and the associated tensions. So after two Palagnesia sessions, one with Paco's assistant and one with Paco himself, I remember that a huge amount of tension was just released from me. So I was literally trembling for months. Well, not, not completely continuously, but still at intervals with all the tension that was released. So, and in the process, I learned a lot about my own sensibilities and a whole interior world opened up to me that I'd never known before. So it was really a big discovery. So a lot of thanks to Paco for that. Now, two years after the experience with Paco, my situation had actually improved quite a lot. And the exhaustion had been reduced from several months to at most a couple of weeks, one or two weeks. And that was much more manageable. At the same time, I came into contact with La Vie, which is a small Catholic institution with a charism for healing. And I went there initially to help a friend who was having a rough time. Um, but then I also decided to try whether the charism could help me to give kind of the last push to overcome 
the last things of Tourette that were still, um, well, bothering me in a way. So not only that, I was also kind of fascinated by the charism itself and its methodology. And I thought it was also very interesting to compare it to the philosophy I'd learned from Polo because, well, I was working on kind of a spiritual approach to healing through Polo. And I thought, okay, maybe there is some overlap. And indeed, I discovered a profound agreement, but also some differences in emphasis that I thought could be mutually beneficial on the one hand to the philosophy of Polo and on the other hand to, to La Vie. So Polo in conversations has said that the fact that our human spirit doesn't fully inform our body is a fruit of original sin. So original sin makes sure that there's kind of a break in us that makes sure that we're kind of not completely spiritualized as we will be in heaven. Um, it is also clear from Christian thought more generally that sin has created this brokenness in us. Now the charism of La Vie has a lot to do with these consequences of original sin. And it constitutes, you could say, a special grace to overcome these consequences so that our interior can be profoundly healed. By the way, that's not to say that after this healing we will be in heaven because and that there will be no more suffering. That's not the case. Um, also, so actually last Sunday we read a gospel about a blind man in the ninth chapter of St. John's gospel. And we were actually reading that in a bit in a, a mass in La Vie with the bishop of our diocese there, Monsieur Hendricks. And he pointed out in that sermon, which was very nice, that uh, the blind man, after being cured, actually still had to overcome all kinds of hardships uh, because people didn't believe him or didn't, uh, well, started to accuse him of all sorts of stuff. Um, but anyway, he said that the light that he received in his eyes was a great help for him to stay on the right uh, road and for him to live uh, also a faith, his, his faith in Jesus and so on. So he was no longer alone on his, in his hardship and on his road through life. Um, so yeah, I think this is interesting to point out that we're, this is not the idea is that, that we get rid of all suffering in life, but the idea is that we do get cured interiorly of a lot of stuff that is in us um, that can kind of make it difficult for us to, um, to be in relationship with God and with others. Now, the method that La Vie uses, which is kind of a method that accompanies the charism, is a method as it has three steps. So the first step is kind of entering into our brokenness or our frailty. Uh, we first need to enter to see what is there. Um, so actually, for me, both the what I learned from the, the normal psychologist, but then more profoundly from Paco, uh, had helped me to actually do just that, to go into my brokenness and explore what is really there. A second step that I, I learned at La Vie is that of accepting the brokenness. And Polo actually says that acceptance is the highest form of love in the human being. Um, at La Vie, people add that, that accepting, accepting this brokenness helps us to open up, to not to be closed in, uh, that the brokenness is not closed in on itself. So that it kind of, through accepting it, it kind of opens up to more influence, which then leads to a third phase, which people at La Vie express as being. Now, for someone trained in Polo's philosophy, this terminology is very suggestive because it suggests that we somehow, that somehow the person that we are, and Polo says that we are persons, and that personhood can kind of shine through in the brokenness, you could say. Moreover, Polo, we know that Polo describes the person as transparent light. Um, so, which means that in a way, God's light can shine through our light. So we have a certain light that can kind of, well, shed light on our brokenness, see what's going on. But then if God comes in and shines through us, then we can see even better. Um, and then God's light is actually what can redeem us of our brokenness uh, and actually bring even more curing according to the charism of La Vie. So what people at, at La Vie will often do is advise people to stay with their brokenness. In other words, focus your attention on that brokenness so that your personal light can enlighten it and God's light can shine through you to redeem it. And with this method, they actually have helped many people over the last 25 years. I think it's also important to say that many of these people are not religious believers. They were people that, that uh, may or may not have uh, faith, but they are 
So the people at Levy are very convinced that God helps everyone. Um, and up to the point that they allow themselves to be helped, of course. If at a certain point they say, okay, now it's enough, no further, then of course God will also stop. But God in principle wants to help everyone. Okay, so I think from the above, it is clear that Polish philosophy can help to clarify the methodology of La Vie. For example, in this, this notion of um, acceptance of the highest form of love and, and uh, being as personal being and all those kind of things. Um, but also I think La Vie's charism and practice can help us realize that curing the brokenness may be essential to reuniting the worldviews that Polo has described in Radical y la Libertad, as the three roots that I talked about earlier. Because understanding how these go together in theory does not mean that this understanding works in practice. Um, however, if we, if we manage to kind of cure our interior brokenness more profoundly, then suddenly it becomes possible to integrate um, from our personal being, integrate our results and also our mind and our um, ideals that we strive for. So we start to come together. At La Vie, they, they talk about this in a little bit. Uh, so they have a, their own terminology that they talk about the little, the small human being, the little man, uh, which they say is the redeemed version of the old man. So it's like our, our earthly nature. Polo actually calls this um, just human nature. He calls it human nature. So it's kind of our earthly part. And then he's, uh, the, the person they called the God geschapenheid or the, what is created as by God, which is a little bit confusing because of course we're completely created by God. But I think it's clear that they, what they want to say that kind of the more spiritual part in us that is kind of most resembles God in a way. So, and they say, well, these two, they, they call it two natures, but they don't, they don't say it's a dualism. They say it's the two natures are one, right? And the whole thing is that there's a break which comes through original sin and that needs to be overcome so that the two natures can fuse again and come together. Um, and then once the fusion comes by, actually you receive, you come to this integration of the three views that Polo was mentioning. Now, these considerations help us understand that the feedback mechanisms in the human being actually do not stop at all at epigenetics. There are many more feedback mechanisms, first on a biological uh, level, but then even our spirituality can have profound effects on our biology, as it did, for example, on my tiredness for Gilles de la Tourette, which after doing all these things actually went away a lot. Okay, so this is the main thing I wanted to say, and I just want to present to you this idea of the summer school that we are thinking of doing, um, just so you know about it. Um, we had this plan to hold a summer school. For, well, we have the plan to hold this summer school from the Sunday, July, the second to Friday, June. Sorry, I say, wait, I have to correct this. It's not actually June. It's, uh, it's, uh, I have to, it's July. That's very important. So I'll just correct it on the fly because uh, I was a little bit rushed in making this presentation. So my apologies. Uh, but here we go. This is corrected. So, um, yeah, Sunday, July the 2nd to Friday, July the 7th. Uh, and it's going to be in Hilo, which is in the Netherlands. Um, Hilo is a diocesan sanctuary where the seminary is located and various different activities are organized. And the idea is to have a mixed program with lectures and discussion in the morning and opportunity for participating in Holy Mass, time for recollection. People of La Vie will also participate and some and participants will have an opportunity for personal guidance by them. And also the lady that founded La Vie, Elizabeth Duet, will be able to join us one afternoon. She's actually quite a reserved person and she prefers not to speak in public, uh, but she will be present during an adoration. And she has said that those people who participate in that adoration will benefit from the grace of her charism, which to me is quite mysterious. And uh, well, we'll see what happens. But anyway, um, the program will also include some free time, uh, which people can either use for further recollection or for exploring the Netherlands, we could do some excursions. And the program will also include some social activities. Um, but because we prefer an intimate setting, the number of participants will lay, lie between like 12 and 15. So if the interest in the program is much greater, we do intend to repeat the week, uh, possibly also in other countries in the future. Even though I cannot, of course, guarantee that Elizabeth will 
also be able to come uh, in those instances. But anyway, so if you're interested in, in that, um, you might be uh, interested in joining an hour or, or also in the future, uh, then it would be nice if you could let me know through uh, through this form, which is like bit.ly slash days, health and healing days, which is what they're called. Um, so this is what I wanted to say. And now I think it's a great time to open up the floor for questions and for the discussion. I'll just paste the link in the in the chat uh, in case anyone wants to fill that out. And then I'll stop sharing my screen. And then we can have a nice conversation, which uh, is what we're also here for. So any reactions or, um, yeah. I would like to say that um, I'm a chemical engineering. Before studying philosophy, I studied chemical engineering. So I know also about epigenetics. OK. Like there's a Catalan scientific that is called Monero Salle. Yeah. Uh, he studied a lot epigenetics. So I, I, and I also know Paco Moya, so I'm, I'm full. Um, yeah, uh, all, all what you said, I can't say it in English. I it agree. resonates with you. I plenty agree with that. Yeah. Oh, that's nice to hear. And, well, I'm a, and also with the charismatic approach that I, I, I went to Christmas, um, well, I'm very interested uh, of doing this uh, summer school. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, about I, the summer school. Yeah, it's great to hear, Kim. There, there will be healing prayer also. With the, Sorry? The, there will be healing prayer. Yeah. Healing well, prayer. Their, their, their charism doesn't really work. So I don't think, I don't know whether they would see themselves as charismatics as usually understood. So they're, it's not like um, they don't do like group sessions with people praying for each other for healing. Uh, it's usually what they do is kind of one to one conversations um, in which they help people to apply to kind of apply their methodology. And then they do a lot of Eucharistic adoration. And so the idea is that during the Eucharistic adoration, some of the grace of the charism actually helps people. Um, but it's not the traditional kind of well, what you would usually associate with charismatics in that way. So, okay. well, that's good. Yeah, that's just to clarify. Yeah, so I think it's they do more like based on individual conversations and just helping people to um, go at things in their in yeah at their own pace in a way. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Thank you a lot. Well, it's great to hear that uh, this resonates with you. Yeah. Any other any other questions or um, or comments? I would like to first thank you for the the chat the your words, and I would like to know how can I buy the book that you wrote? Oh, the freedom in quarantine one. Huh? The the freedom in quarantine. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, you can find it on Amazon. So if you okay. if you go to Amazon, then there you'll you'll be able to uh, to buy it. Um, if you if you if you're only interested in the text of Polo, then you can also just download it from. Um, I think if you Google "Lo Radical y la Libertad" Leonardo Polo, then you can find the the Spanish text online, mm -hmm. uh, which is I think available on the website of the University of Navarre. Um, the the other one is uh yeah it, it just costs a few few euros um and i i do that to <laughs> to finance my <laughs> my promotion thing so i i hope well anyway it's i i didn't make it very expensive so i hope that uh, that works i will do that and then the other thing is uh, just a comment um uh, my husband died of cancer oh uh, two what years. A and, uh, and the thing, the wonderful time we spent together uh, for 19, I mean, 11 months yeah. was so serious, the joy that he has and I had. Yeah. So I wanted to, to discover what was behind that because yeah. he, he's, uh, he has a, a cancer in the brain. So yeah. he, he's um, never cognitive uh, process was going down every minute or every month yeah. but still we could connect 
in a spiritual ways in the in ways that I now I am understanding more and with your words yeah it had helped me to because it was so amazing even the 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 the, the moment he died also yeah. it was so amazing how we all were to connect to him yeah so thank you so much for for giving us this um, to open up this world that we're normally we normally don't have the opportunity to learn because we we're just science is so um it, it's not united and also we don't get to travel by jet to our hearts so thank you very much yeah yeah no worries and indeed that's for me that's also been the big voyage of discovery i've always been a, a pretty rationalist hard hitting scientist you know and um and for me so the, the Tourette has really kind of pushed me out of that comfort zone uh, because it's in a way it's it's easy to to remain kind of closed up in your head uh, but then of course that's one of the things that Paco really did for me is to to really existentially show me that if you focus also on your body there's a lot of spirituality in your body there's a lot of spirit in your body <laughs> and the spirit has, has a lot of influence there uh, and through your body, you can actually access many things that are are bothering you. So uh, memories from the past or or things that are um, kind of blocked there. Uh, and so the people at La Vie share this experience. And I think many, more broadly, many people start to discover uh, actually the spiritual meanings of our body, which are very, very profound. Um, and of course, the, the philosophy of Polo also very much helps to... Um, helps us to understand what you were just saying Kalena about the experience you had with your with your husband which is uh on the one hand very sad but on the other hand very beautiful of course um and uh and so he says for example that well also the light that we have in our minds the idea that the ideas that we have in our minds they need to be well we don't always realize that there there has to be a light that shines on them so the ideas are like the moon Right, they're they are there, but they're they're just a kind of a rock, and there needs to be a light from the sun that shines on them so that we can see the moon, and that light says Polo comes from the person. So Aristotle had actually called this the agent intellect, the, the this light, but Polo says, well, this agent intellect is nothing else than the person that we are. So we are our our our, our spiritual core, you could say is what, what makes us able to understand. And it makes us able to understand in our heads, but we can also use that light to shine it on our bodies. And we can uh, kind of understand and be aware also of the world around us in a more direct way, not only through our minds. And of course, yeah. And this personhood in us, also Polo says, is not just understanding, it's also freedom, it's also love, and it's also togetherness, being together with others. Um, and and so, you know, Polo really explores these deep what we are, what we are as persons. And so, what what I find beautiful and what Paco has showed me, but also what Lavi is showing me, is that actually, if you go into your your brokenness, exactly the things that 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 kind of prevent you from seeing this, then little by little you start to um, come into deeper contact with these these realities in our in us. Um, so yeah, maybe that's a little bit more elaboration on, on that aspect. No, no, thank you very much. You were saying that. And I think the spirituality of the person that that was that is, it was my husband, was what was giving me light. Yes. And I was in my person to him in the same way. Not, yes. Uh, because he couldn't speak uh, for the last six months. He yeah. just can look at me in, in in his eyes he will give me his soul or yeah. his spirit or the person he was now that yeah. i studied polo and i have listened to you yeah so Cedric, thank you very much thank you thank you for sharing dan i i had a question please but first i just wanted to say it was wonderful to hear that you were so vulnerable saying your problem yeah I also get to know Polo through Paco. Anyway, so I have several students. They are 
biomedicine students and they are very scientists. So yeah. how would you explain that there is much more than that? Sometimes I try, but it's like a barrier, you know, like they don't believe it. Yeah. Well, I think what I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> but something, I well, don't know. So, um, so actually the, the talk that I gave today, uh, much of that I, I have developed earlier in my classes. So I also right. teach at Amsterdam University College and oh. I, so it's a, it's, um, sorry, a, a subject, which is called introduction to health and well-being. And in it, we study some of the history of health and well-being, but also some of the philosophy. And so what I, what I do there is I, I take them through some of the early thinking about health. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we go on and I also I attack genetic reductionism with them, which mm -hmm. tends to be something that's very, you know, it sticks in their brain or it's something that that's present to them. Um, on the one hand, if they really think about it, they also don't really agree with it, but they've always been taught that, you know, we're just our genes and that's it. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and so if, if you, if I challenge that view, then suddenly uh, it's like a paradigm shift for them. So they, they start to see that it's not it's not the way they always thought and mm -hmm. sometimes you learn most by unlearning things <laughs> okay uh, and so well i actually use a, a book by by dennis noble uh which is called the music of life in which mm -hmm. he argues very clearly about that that so the, the, noble by the way is not a christian he's he's not a believer i think okay. he's so more or less a spiritual man but he he doesn't really believe in Jesus Christ or anything, mm -hmm. but he's a good biologist. And he just shows that, for example, the things that Dawkins is saying are just not, yeah, not, not tenable anymore with a, with a new biological insight. So I, that really helps me a lot to then help the students see that, wait, we have to rethink, really rethink our view of what it means to be human. And then I come with these, with Polo, and then we try <laughs> to think about that. So this is my approach. So actually okay. in this week that I'm going to do, um, my idea is to take people through this approach a little bit more in depth. So I've now done it very uh, in, a, in an outline, but I want to do it in more depth uh, because I think right. it's interesting. Because it's really first, well, the, the determinism in a way is also very comfortable because you can mm -hmm. say, well, you know, it's not my fault. It's all, it's it's my genes. It's my, it's my nice. environment. I am determined by my environment. I'm determined by my genes. I don't have to do anything. So I'm just I'm just a poor sufferer, and this is it. But then, mm -hmm. then you you challenge that, and then you start to see, oh wait, but maybe I have a bit more agency. And on the one hand, that's an opportunity, but on the other hand, that's also a burden because so mm -hmm. you, you you have to be an agent. <laughs> um, right. And but then of course you have you come in with with the different views, and then you start to see, okay, well this agency is it just individualistic because then it's really heavy uh, or is it really not individualistic but is it really more uh personal which means also in relationship and that i don't all have to carry all by myself you know uh, yeah. and that's much more doable in a way um so that's then the kind of question you can start to explore so this is kind of my way of actually approaching the kind of students that you have uh, okay. in front of you and if you want to know more about it, I'd be happy to to talk further if you like, or if you want to ask more things, then. Perfect. Thank you. I'm afraid I need to go. Okay. But thanks very much. No worries. And uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to to be in touch or let me know. Perfect. You, yeah. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. I'm leaving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kalena. No, I think that uh, what Doletti said, it's, uh, I think uh, it's uh, some days ago that uh, psychology um, 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 have spoken about um, um, about illness. And yes. um, uh, he said that the um, medical or I don't speak very well in <laughs> in English. No worries. <laughs> so uh, um, they heal only the the symptom, 
yeah. that um, don't uh, really the root uh, cause, no? Yeah. And I think uh, when the students of uh, medicine, uh, if they study more the human, um, yeah. like uh, you said this, but also more psychology, so maybe yeah. it's also the first step that um, because um, uh, in the psychology you you can see that everything what happened inside um, of you um, yeah. the the body manifestate manifestates this no yeah. and maybe it could be also the way uh, to understand better um, the the un uh, unity. Uh, between our body and uh, our inside, no? the whole person. Yeah, no, certainly. So I think um, it's it's a step-by-step a -step process to, to help people kind of get out of their, um, their yeah, reductionist view, uh, but then really try to build a, a richer view. Um, but I, I, and so I, I do think that studying philosophy uh, is certainly going to help with that, right? Yeah, so, it's, yeah. Because, of course, also my students, they tend to study mostly science. And I think science is great. Science can really help us a lot. And, and I'm a scientist and I love science. Um, but it's also clear that science is good for certain things, but not so good for other things. Mm -hmm. And especially these more intimate things that are closer to the spirit, the human spirit, are maybe not that... Well, the scientific method is not that suitable for studying the spirit because very often it's unique. So, for example, I what I came up with uh, when exploring my interior are some are memories from the past uh, mm -hmm. that that are unique to me. And of course, it's true that you know you do you do have evidence based psychology, and evidence based psychology does tell you, for example, that revisiting trauma from the past actually helps you to overcome the trauma. People have seen that that helps. And, and there's, there's been studies, and so they've studied that in a scientific way, you could say. Very good, but that still doesn't, doesn't tell me what, it, what is wrong with me, you know? So what, what did yeah. those memories do with me? Yeah. And so one of the things that Paco, for example, told me was that I, I have a certain sensitivity for ins, 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 insecurity in other people. Now, you cannot do, say that with a scientific study, because it's something that is just unique to me, you know, it's not other people don't have that or may have it, but but not everybody with Tourette has this particular symptomology. So it's it's very unique to people. And and I think that opening up this um, this panorama for people is very helpful. However, um, I do want to reemphasize what I said earlier, and that's also why the week I'm doing I'm doing doesn't has an academic component but also a spiritual component um, is because there is not such a thing well to to really understand ourselves profoundly it's not enough to only do the theory we we, we can only understand that if we really do the work in a way so really go inside ourselves and and see what is there because only then can we really understand so mm -hmm. because philosophy doesn't really have the scientific um you can't do just an experiment to show it the only experiment you can do is to actually go inside yourself and see what's there um and and that is kind of the the challenge of it all but it's also be the beauty i think um yeah and and so that's why and by the way this is also i think something nice because the first universities when they started I think they were like seminaries. They were were places where people were educated in theology. They were studying philosophy, and it was very much a place for intellectual development, but also for spiritual developments. Like the seminaries are still now, as Quinn will hopefully be able to say as well. Um, and this is something that's been completely lost from the university. So there's no longer a place, a secular place, or well, more or less even a Catholic place, where where well, I mean. You have, of course, places where students can come and have some spiritual development, but it's not like there's a program that really in which spiritual development and intellectual development go together. It's yeah. like two two thing two wings of the same. And I think for these kind of topics, it's essential. We need to have yeah. that. So this is also what I'm trying to do with this with these weeks. 
to really have a place where the two wings the spiritual and the reasonable uh the, the the reason in a way the theoretical go together to um delve deeply and and to really see who we are and at the same time i think that can really help to to improve our our health our spiritual health um but also to to just deeply learn who we are so i think that's yeah. uh no i uh, i would like to say that i never heard about the institute uh lavi no. And I think it's for me, it's very beautiful yeah. because um, now after the session with uh, Luis and yeah. uh, studying a little bit Leonardo Polo, yeah. um, the anthropology uh, helped me to practice uh, my spiritual life. So yes. I know uh, that it's, uh, it's very different the one year ago. So yeah. Uh, and I think this institute uh, help uh, really um, to practice the spiritual life. So yes, you, yes. Uh, and then um, you can discover God. And uh, really, I think it's uh, very helpful uh, for the Catholic people, but also uh, for the people without um, uh, faith. Yeah. No. So I think. Um, yeah, I am very interested. I would like to uh, participate in this, but <laughs> maybe in the next time. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's very useful, and it's I think it's great. Wonderful. Well, I mean, if if you would uh, fill out a little form there, I just put it there so that also for people um, who cannot do it this time, but maybe another time. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, I if we if we're if we're in touch, then I can keep you updated about future um, yeah. things we may be doing. And Elizabeth, uh, she knows something about Leonardo Polo, or I've told her a bit. Um, so we're good friends now, and <laughs> um, I have told her a bit. And whatever I tell her, she's like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so Leonardo Polo is the, the the philosoph, and she is the practice. <laughs> yes, in a way. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's. I mean, good, she's but... not the she's not the only one, of course, because there's other people that. That can be inspired in different ways by Polo, so it's, she's not exclusive. But but clearly, uh, Polo helps a lot to explain what they're doing, uh, and I think uh, I do think that that what they do helps people to understand Polo as well. So I think yeah. it's a two way street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. It's, no worries. It's... Thank you for your questions. Uh, so Dan, yes. Um... That week in Halo, I am yeah. trying to set my mind to to that and uh, thing. I think it has a purpose. Uh, the purpose being self improvement. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, self improvement in the way of really deeply getting to know yourself. Um, yeah, that's right. And um, and that is. Uh, 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 in terms of health and healing so health being uh, uh mental or spiritual health yes even though i mean like my that i'm also noticing some consequences in my body oh yeah surprising yeah. but but it also works it won't help you to cure a broken arm i think but <laughs> it yeah, may yeah. help you cure other things yeah no i i agree um so but it's also um requires uh, uh, a brokenness so um, don't worry we all have that so th that's uh... <laughs> uh, uh, yes yes so I can I can uh, I I mean I I can see some uh, things I would like to improve in myself as as uh, as I would say as always almost yeah exactly uh, but um, yeah I mean I think <clears throat> for myself it would then help to <clears throat> meditate a little bit first uh, on okay I have more or less this or this issue that I would like to uh, improve or would you say well that's not really relevant just go there and, and have a good time uh, how, how would you uh... well you, you can do both I yeah. mean it's not super necessary to come there with a particular issue to fix it's a good that's a good question by the way in case thanks a lot yeah. you don't really need to come with a particular issue to fix even yeah. though you may come there with a particular issue to fix, to fix. So what, what will happen is that we'll have the, in the morning, we'll have 
like the more theoretical uh, philosophical sessions or a bit about biology as well and then in the afternoon there's an opportunity that you may or may not use to talk to people of la vie and yeah. there you can say well, you could take things along that you say okay well this is something that i you know i walk it well something i i'm struggling with or something that i would like to fix or um you could take that to those sessions. Those sessions are not obligatory. So you don't have to talk to people, the people of La Vie, um, but you may do so. And it may yeah. help you if you've thought about it before and you say, okay, well, these are things that I'd like to work on. That may help you. Then yeah. in the Wednesday afternoon, there will this, be this session with Elizabeth. So we'll basically be sitting in the chapel with her. And then she says, well, whoever is there is going to experience what this charism does to you. So I, I've never done that. So I don't know what this will be like. This is a surprise to me. So I'll, okay. just go, I'll just go there and see what happens. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it will be special, but I, 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 I don't know. So it's a surprise. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but, but the, the whole week, let's say, is oriented towards, uh, let's say, improve, improvement. And it no. is, uh, um, so, I mean, even the morning uh, theoretical sessions are uh, theorizing about, this improvement as you already uh yeah. just, just as the, in, in 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 a way in which you summarized it already in your lecture just now so that's right that's right yeah so so the the theory has that actual purpose yes and 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 the the people uh it's always nice uh, to know uh, are they uh from uh, different countries uh, or how many people are coming more or less have you got any idea well so the, I've said uh, what will happen. There will be about twelve to fifteen people in the core group. I think that's yeah. my that's my idea because also we have like we have twelve rooms available. Oh yeah. Uh, yesterday I talked to your wife and she said that you would probably stay at your house and just come by car because it's only half an hour from where you live. Oh, but, that would be yeah. Yeah. So then so then that also saves a lot of money and <laughs> and you could be the extra participant. So then maybe we could be 14 or so or 15. Oh, yeah. Um and then uh so that could be helpful. Um and then the the people that will be there, I, I don't know yet. Uh so yeah. I only know that we have yeah. So I'm I'm seeing. I'm I'm hoping that there will be some people from the Netherlands. Um I'm hoping that there will be some people uh from abroad and um, yeah Quim will come so uh, we have someone from uh, from Spain and Italy Catalonia from Catalonia no oh, Catalonia okay good yeah that's uh, a different that's... <laughs> no sorry yeah thanks for correcting me but <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a joke it's a joke it's just Spain actually <laughs> very good and um, yeah no so that that's um, uh, that will be wonderful and so I, I estimate at the moment that uh, the cost for the week if for people that will be staying there, I've just had a, an estimate of the cost from the from the place, and I I think it will be about six hundred euros for the whole the whole week, oh, yeah. um, and I'm I'm going to talk to a, a foundation um, to see whether they would be able to give us some scholarships. So for people who have fewer uh, less money available, whether they could provide scholarships. So I hope that's possible, but I I cannot guarantee that yet. But I have some context, and I'm going to try to to arrange that. So uh, then, maybe at some point, you can let me know if I'm coming from my house. Uh, what the price will be less, I suppose. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So you, you can let me know at some point. Uh, yeah. What it what it will be, and um, and the people are also non-believers. Uh, there are a few, so that um, I don't that I don't feel too lonely. I will be hugging you every day, okay? So you won't feel lonely. But uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Um, I think, yeah, at least uh, I think my sister will join, and she, I don't. Well, she's at least not a Catholic, so I, no. I, I think it will be majority Catholics, but they will be my, nice people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they will be nice. Yes. Okay, great. So that's 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 uh, okay. I'll I'll uh, check out the. Uh, I think it's a website here uh, that uh, bit point 
dot l y uh, it gives some information and uh okay yeah, so that's that's just that's just a link to a form that i made um oh. so if you uh if you fill out the information there then i will i will update you with all the well i mean i already have your contact but uh, i will update you with, with more information about the when it's coming out and so by the way by the way uh the the, the program it uh, the, the let's say the format the 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 uh, yeah. did you create this format uh, for uh, um i mean um so i'm thinking in terms of the psychological benefit uh, did, did you did you did you uh, create this yourself this format yes and no i mean I, I thought of it but it's kind of based on the way i do summer courses and it's a, it's a long uh, tried and uh, very effective way of uh, both resting and learning and having a good time so <laughs> yeah yeah but but uh, so i mean maybe i should not be uh, uh, too um, leaning too heavy on uh, self improvement because uh, if if it is there that's fine and if it's not there it should also be okay i think but i mean yeah. But 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 uh, still still um, I think maybe this is different from what you have done before. I don't know. It's actually a question. It's different. Uh, my question is: isn't isn't it different because this is the first time that you are having a really um, uh, a goal uh, a goal with this uh, spiritual improvement? Let let's just for want of a word call it spiritual improvement, and I would I would call it a psychological improvement. Yeah. So. So this is, let's say, uh, not yet uh, what you call an evidence-based method. <laughs> uh, it's 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 a uh, let's say it's a uh, experiment more. At well, there's there's certainly something of an experiment to it, but the 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 kind of courses that I go to in the summer, for example, do also have a a goal of, of self improvement in a way. Um, and so in that, I I, I mean. It's it is different, but there's also quite a substantial overlap. So I, I mean, it's an experiment, but not a very risky one. That's what I would say. Yeah, not not risky in terms of uh, you know I, I don't think of it uh, in terms of you you know you can't lose. If no. it doesn't if it doesn't work, it doesn't hurt. But in in those terms, but in in, in also to 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 temper my own expectations, uh, also the uh, charismatic part. Of course, I am not familiar with so in that yeah. sense it, it it to me it looks the most sensational yeah in uh, so that would be a, a particular point i think on the uh, wednesday there yeah and, and if i am so lucky to to have that uh, lady uh, let's say put giving me attention yeah. uh, and uh, so uh, uh, and the other days are uh, sort of yeah um it it's it's not uh, the other days are not directly therapeutic let's say i mean uh, if i just i'm just sort of trying to 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 guess huh? so i would say that if you t if you talk in terms of being therapeutic the the other days are uh, uh let's say you you get insights insights to the relationship between a body and mind i would say yeah and and through through that insight you can already uh uh find some uh, uh therapy i would i would i would say yeah um i just read a book by uh i will i will i will keep this very short but i just read a book uh, by psychi uh, psychiatrist bram bakker yeah. who was who was also and you also have another psych, psych psychiatrist i'm just reading it's called uh, the body keeps the score yeah i read that that's very nice and so 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 I would, cool. so i would say there is a big overlap between what you are talking about and the body keeps the score absolutely yeah no truly i mean these are different people that are discovering the same things in different ways um, so, and he comes at it more from a from a classical psychology angle even though also not very classical because he you know he's very open to new ideas and whatever so but he he does find that you know healing healing trauma through the body is, uh, is probably a very powerful way that also kind of more regular um psychiatrists should should consider more and yeah. uh yeah so he's kind of running ahead of the flock in that way but i yeah. i really like uh, i really like his approach yeah vessel from the cork vessel from the cork yeah uh, but so that means that just for me now i am gaining insight into your week 
it, it means that let's say I would call the most days um, uh, body keeps the score days eh? because because I'm gaining I'm gaining this uh, uh, just for me to have uh, something to yeah, hold yeah. on. Uh, uh, body keeps the score days uh, because in the morning we are gaining insight and then in the afternoons we can uh, exchange with each other uh, and then um, and then with the exception of the Wednesday where a, a lady comes with a, a specific talent uh, to possibly to possibly accelerate this this, uh, process, this yeah. he healing it would is that more or less that's summary? A, that's a good summary thank you case Oh, okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks very much. It's interesting anyway. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks everyone. Thanks Clara, Quim and, uh, and Case, uh, Brigitte and, and Monica have just, have just joined. Uh, but, uh, thanks a lot for, for being here. Um, I'm just going to have a five minute break now before we start the Spanish session. Um, so that's, uh, thanks a lot for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thank for, you. Thank, thanks. You. thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no worries. And uh, well, hopefully to another time. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.